Welcome to this video. This is Mark Scythian. The date today is June 10th, 2019. The title of this video is Gas Turbine Jet Engine Horsepower Explained. There seems to be some confusion out there in the world regarding gas turbine jet engine horsepower, especially gas turbine engine cores that are set up for jet propulsion applications. Therefore, this lecture was created to address the various power distributions in the typical gas turbofan jet engine. First off, we must start with compressor horsepower. This is the mechanical shaft horsepower required to drive the compressor or compressor spools to keep the engine lit by means of heat of air compression transmitted by the turbines or the turbine stack through the absorption of thermal energy converted into mechanical shaft horsepower extracted from kerosene jet fuel combustion. So the formula for compressor horsepower is listed right here. This is the temp rise of the heat of air compression of the mass airflow that enters the compressor in Fahrenheit multiplied times the pounds per second mass airflow that enter the compressor only on a turbofan that would be the total mass airflow divided into the fan bypass ratio. This then multiplied times the number of BTUs to raise one pound of mass air by one degree Fahrenheit then multiply times 778 foot-pounds per second mechanical power, which equals, which is the amount of mechanical power that equals 1 BTU per second heat output, in this case in the form of heat of air compression. This product then divided into 550, which is the number of foot-pounds per second that equals 1 horsepower. So this is the power extracted from the fuel lost to keep the engine running. That's why the compressor rotates to provide the heat of air compression required to ignite the fuel. Next we have thrust horsepower. This is simply the ratio between the forward speed of a propulsion engine in feet per second divided into 550 this ratio then multiply times the pounds net thrust output. So what this formula is saying for thrust horsepower is that for every 550 feet per second true airspeed that a propulsion engine is in forward motion, one pound of net thrust will equal one thrust horsepower. So if you were to spool up a gas turbofan jet engine or a turbojet, to maximum static thrust and you held the engine at rest so there was no forward motion of the engine the V FPS would be zero and divided into 50 would be zero and then zero times the net thrust is equal to zero so this proves mathematically that when you're at maximum static thrust as long as that engine is not moving there is exactly zero thrust horsepower However, when at maximum throttle and static thrust, there will be maximum compressor horsepower because more and more fuel is going in, more and more compression is needed. You're going to have to go to maximum compressor horsepower. So simply saying there is no power when the engine is not moving forward when at maximum throttle makes no sense because you have to designate what kind of power. So compressor horsepower, just like compression in a piston engine, that's the power lost to keep the engine running. It's classified as friction horsepower. And whatever you have left thereafter is the brake horsepower. When you add them together, you then have the indicated horsepower. So you gotta be careful what kind of power you're dealing with, and you must specify the nomenclature of power in, power out, power available, power lost. It's extremely important or else the uh, description will not make any sense. So we'll use an example, the General Electric CF680 C2B1 gas turbofan jet engine. These are the following specifications 
and will be working within a test facility, let's say at 55 degrees Fahrenheit outside air temperature. Uh, we have all the specifications listed so we can do the appropriate power distribution calculations. First thing we must do is calculate the minimum horsepower required to drive the compressor in order to keep the engine lit when at maximum throttle. So we have to take advantage of the absolute value adiabatic heat of air compression for gas turbine engines as a thermodynamics algorithm. So when extracted out of the differential equation, we're left with the Rankine's absolute temperature degree scale because we're using US English units. And we can then take the data from the specifications and enter them in pressure ratio to the 0.263 power. So 24.3 to the 0.263 power minus one times the outside air temperature in degrees Rankine. So that would be the Fahrenheit degrees plus 460, then divided into the compressor efficiency in decimal form, followed by adding it to the outside air temperature again. So we have a minimum compressor discharge air temperature of 1,417 degrees Rankine. Subtract 460 from that, and we have a minimum compressor discharge air temperature of about 960 degrees Fahrenheit approximately. Take that data and subtract, or take that compressor discharge temperature, subtract the outside air temperature from it. This will calculate the delta T, the actual temperature rise through the heat of air compression from outside air temperature to compressor discharge air temperature. So this becomes 902.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we take the maximum mass airflow entering the fan duct in the compressor, since we're at maximum throttle, we divide that into the fan bypass ratio. So 329 pounds per second mass airflow are entering only the compressor, multiply times the temperature rise, and then it takes 0.24 BTU to raise one pound of mass air by one degree Fahrenheit. And then we have the BTU per second now. There's exactly 778 foot pounds per second mechanical power per one BTU per second heat output. Now we have everything in foot pounds per second mechanical power. We then divide that to 550, the number of foot pounds per second mechanical power to one horsepower. So it will require a 100,803 compressor horsepower to keep the engine lit when at maximum throttle. So it's important you specify the power distribution in accordance to the first law of thermodynamics so here we have power loss to keep the engine running, friction horsepower, extracted out of a potential energy, total power, and whatever is left, we subtract the friction horsepower from the indicated, we're left with the brake horsepower. So that's the actual usable power that allows the engine to do what it does for useful work. So 100,000 compressor, or 100,803 compressor horsepower is required to keep the General Electric CF6 80C2B1 uh, gas turbo fan jet engine running or lit when at maximum throttle. So this would be equal to the power loss to keep the engine running. And uh, compressor horsepower is classified as friction horsepower. So the specification for the thrust specific fuel consumption, let's say we're at maximum throttle, it will uh, be designated as 0.323 pounds kerosene jet fuel consumption per one pound of thrust over one hour. So at maximum uh, static thrust, maximum throttle, we have 56,717 pounds. We simply take the thrust specific fuel consumption. We multiply it times the static thrust in pounds, divide it by 60 minutes. We get the pounds per minute kerosene fuel consumption when at maximum throttle. We then divide that into 60 seconds multiplied times the energy density of kerosene jet fuel. And then we then can calculate the BTU per second input in the form of burning fuel. We then uh, multiply that times the number of watts per one BTU per second, 778 foot pounds per second, divided into 
746 watts per horsepower is about 1.4 horsepower multiplied times 746. So there's exactly, if you do the calculation, there's exactly 1056 watts of power per 1 BTU per second, which is also equal to 778 foot pounds per second. So you take the BTU per second power input into the engine in the form of burning fuel right here, multiply it times the watts per 1 BTU per second, and that will calculate 100 million 641024 watts of power input into the engine in the form of burning fuel. So this would be your uh, total available power in the form of burning fuel, right? We divide that into 746 watts per horsepower. So that's in the form of burning fuel input power of 134,908 horsepower. Now we subtract the power loss to keep the engine running, which is the compressor horsepower. We're left with a brake, avail a brake horsepower or available power, thirty four thousand one hundred five brake horsepower. So the usable power output divided into the total power input in the form of burning kerosene jet fuel translates to approximately twenty five percent brake thermal efficiency when at maximum power in regard to the CF six gas turbofan jet engine. So in maximum throttle and equivalent horsepower in the form of burning kerosene jet fuel of 134,908 horsepower is delivered into the combustion chamber. 100,803 horsepower is required to drive the compressor or power loss to keep the gas turbine jet engine running. Heat of air, by means of heat of air compression as the source of heat to ignite the kerosene jet fuel. So that's the purpose of the turbine to extract thermal energy from the burning fuel to then drive the compressor keep the heat of air compression sufficient to ignite the fuel. At maximum throttle, when engine is held at rest, a brake thermal efficiency of 25% is calculated based on a thrust specific fuel consumption of 0.323 pounds kerosene jet fuel per pound of static thrust over one hour. This leaves a brake horsepower or available power of 34,105 brake horsepower at a specified average compressor RPM between both N1 and N2 spools. 34,105 brake horsepower times 746 watts per horsepower equals 25,442,330 watts of power or 25.4 megawatts of power or 25.4 megajoules per second of power. That's available power now. Only usable power is considered available power output or brake horsepower, which is used to accelerate mass airflow, power electrical and hydraulic systems and power other aircraft systems, etc. Next, we must move on into static thrust and define mathematically what static thrust is. Of course, this is the thrust output when the engine is held at rest, but it's actually the product of the jet velocity in feet per second times the mass airflow total in pounds per second divided by gravity. Since we're using US English units, we're not dealing with uh, Newton's force thrust, which has the gravity component integrated into the 9.8 meters per second squared times kilograms per second mass airflow. We're dealing with the pounds, which then you can differentiate a dividend gravity curve as a divisor. So we do that with the final speed of the jet velocity times the pounds per second mass airflow divided by the gravity acceleration on earth in the US English system of measures 32.2 feet per second squared. So you can easily calculate the static thrust based on this uh, equation or this formula right here. But the purpose of knowing the static thrust is so you can solve for the V2, the average jet velocity in feet per second discharge from the core and fan exhaust nozzles. So we'll set that equation up for static thrust to solve for V2. That is simply the product of the static thrust times the gravity component in US English units, 32.2 feet per second, divided by the mass airflow total entering both the core and the fan duct in pounds per second. So when we do the uh, uh, calculation, when at maximum throttle while engine is held at rest, the average jet velocity of core and fan exhaust nozzles is equal to 1,068 feet per second. Next, we move on to net thrust, also known as dynamic thrust. This is the thrust output when the engine is in forward motion. 
So in order to calculate the dynamic or net thrust, we need to find the effective jet velocity. So this is simply the difference in the oncoming airspeed, airflow, subtracted from the jet velocity. So the effective jet velocity is based on the law of conservation of momentum as well as fluid dynamics equations. So you take the oncoming airspeed, including headwinds, subtract it from the jet velocity, uh, multiply it times the mass airflow in pounds per second total, divide it by gravity, and then you've defined what net thrust is. So there's a little bit of an argument out there if static thrust only exists when the engine is held at rest and net thrust only exists when the engine is in motion. Well, let's just answer that question or that argument or solve that argument through mathematical analysis. So let's say you spool up to maximum throttle. You're at maximum static thrust. You hold the engine at rest. So now you have all 1,068 feet per second jet velocity. You're not moving forward. And we are assuming zero indicated airspeed as in no headwinds, just no airflow approaching the intake of the engine. So zero feet per second for V1. You're left with 1068 for the effective jet velocity times the mass airflow divided by gravity. So we have a net thrust, which is also equal to the static thrust. So FG is indeed equal to FN. Next, we'll ask another sort of trick question here. What is the thrust horsepower of this engine when held at rest when operating at maximum thrust output or full throttle? Well, let's just mathematically solve this uh, problem. We are not in forward motion, zero feet per second, and thrust horsepower is bound by the law of conservation of uh, momentum more so than the fluid dynamics. So we take the zero feet per second forward motion of the propulsion engine. We're holding the engine at rest with the brakes. We're at maximum static thrust, maximum power. Zero is still our forward speed divided by 550 times the net thrust, zero thrust horsepower when at maximum static thrust because we're not moving. We need motion in order to have a relationship between the momentum of the jet velocity or the jet stream and the aircraft and the engine. So the thrust horsepower of any propulsion engine when held at rest while operating at maximum throttle and maximum thrust output is zero. For thrust horsepower to exist, engine must be in forward motion at a speed greater than zero feet per second. So take an example, the Boeing 767-300, it utilizes two General Electric CF6 turbofan jet engine variants. Assume that this Boeing 767-300 airliner is flying at a true airspeed of 300 miles per hour at an indicated airspeed of 345 miles per hour, that includes a 45 mile per hour headwind, while at maximum throttle in lower altitude airspace. Calculate the net thrust in pounds and thrust horsepower of both engines when flying at these specified airspeeds. So we convert 345 miles per hour to feet per second. Every 50 miles per hour is 22 feet per second. So 345 times the ratio of 22 fifteenths equals 506 feet per second. So that is, that is uh, indicated airspeed. So that is the oncoming airspeed, airflow, approaching the engine's intake. So that's V1, 506. Subtract that from jet velocity of 1068. Multiply times the mass airflow in pounds per second. It's at a maximum because we're at max throttle. Divided by gravity. So 29,845 pounds of net thrust. At 345 miles per hour indicated airspeed, each engine will develop a net thrust of 29,845 pounds. Thrust horsepower is an application of the law of conservation of momentum, whereas thrust, our net thrust is an application of fluid dynamics, gases or liquids in motion, as described by Navier-Stokes equation. So the speed and the mass of the air in the thrust stream is equal to the momentum of the aircraft. So the aircraft will absorb that power and start moving. And then you have the weight of the aircraft times its speed, the weight of the air times its speed. They equalize and you can never fly faster than your jet velocity. The thrust, when it overcomes the drag, you go faster. And then at cruise, the thrust will equal the drag. And then the speed of the air, aircraft will equal to the jet velocity. 
you spool down and that would that jet velocity will be your cruise speed so remember thrust horsepower is more uh, related to the law of conservation of momentum which is uh, derived out of newton's second and third laws of motion motion uh, laws of motion whereas net thrust is the application of fluid dynamics and it's best described by uh, navier stokes mathematics equations so moving on here we want to know the thrust horsepower at a true airspeed, that's the actual speed the engine's moving in relationship to the environment or over the ground, independent of oncoming airflow. So that's the true airspeed. So 300 miles per hour converted to feet per second, 440 feet per second. We enter in 440 for the VFPS right down here. Divide it into 550, multiply times the net thrust, 29,845. Net uh, pounds of net thrust, so there's 23,876 thrust horsepower. Each engine develops 29,845 pounds of net thrust and 23,876 thrust horsepower when flying through the air at a true airspeed of 300 miles per hour and an indicated airspeed of 345 miles per hour. Since both engines are operating at approximately the same power metrics, the total Net thrust is 29,845 pounds times 2, or 59,690 pounds total net thrust. And a total thrust horsepower of 23,876 thrust horsepower times 2, or 47,752 total thrust horsepower when flying at an indicated airspeed of 345 miles per hour and a true airspeed of 300 miles per hour when at maximum throttle with an average jet velocity at the core and fan exhaust nozzles of both engines of 1,068 feet per second. Of course, when they get to their cruise speed, they're going to spool down, and uh, after the drag is overcome, the thrust will equal the drag. This will be zero acceleration, and then whatever your jet velocity is, that will equal the forward speed. Remember, it goes back to the law of conservation of momentum. So this is the uh, power distribution analysis of the typical gas turbo fan jet engine. I left a few additional notes, which include the formulas for calculating such things as atmospheric pressure mathematically, air density, uh, the approximate, uh, actually the exact uh, amount of volume to one pound of mass air at sea level, which you can change around to find out at any elevation or temperature, uh, the equivalence in power, and uh, the conversions from metric to U.S. units, the other way around. Just a slight overview on the calculation methodologies, additional to the formulas listed in the uh, lecture. And then, of course, I got the overall pressure uh, equivalencies if you ever have to work with uh, pascals to PSI or millimeters mercury to atmospheres or inches of mercury. Anyway, that concludes this lecture. Thank you for watching and have a great day.